Hi, I'm Nicole Scheidel, Executive Director of Canadian Physicians for Life, and I'm joined here today with Amanda, a member of our team, to talk about a recent news article that's really making the rounds in the international press. And I think as we see the expansion of euthanasia in Canada, we're going to see more of these really, truly awful stories. And I wanted to start by taking a look at this story. We're going to just pull it up here. So a woman with chemical sensitivities chose medically assisted death. So she chose to be euthanized after a failed bid to get better housing. So this was a CTV news article that appeared right before the Easter holidays. And uh, Amanda, what do you think about that? Oh, it's a really startling headline and it's, it's horrible to see. It reminds me of an earlier article with the headline, I die when I run out of money about the connection between assisted suicide and poverty. We know that the situations of despair can heighten a person's vulnerability and even a sort of element of coercion around assisted suicide. It's not such a freely chosen, uh, not so freely chosen as many purported uh, these deaths to be. And so it's, it's tragic and we're seeing in this article a serious, serious cry for help. And that's made explicit by this woman, 51-year-old woman, Sophia herself. And so we learn that she is, she was a 51-year-old Ontario woman with sensitivities to certain chemicals. So certain environmental allergies and, and chemical uh, sensitivities. And she was diagnosed with this. Right, and, and we know- She needed yeah. to find a better, a better living situation. Go ahead. Right. Well, we know like you're not going to die from that, but your life can be made pretty miserable if it's not um, dealt with. Like if you're not taken seriously and been given the help to change your environment to take care of those sensitivities so you're not exposed to them all the time. Exactly. And as we learned throughout the article, the pandemic really exacerbated her situation because like all of us, she has to be she had to be home a lot and being in her living situation where it's, as it's described, uh, the chemicals and the smoke in the apartment building that would uh, come through and, and then affect her, clearly our living situation could have been remedied and it wasn't because of, because of uh, what she could afford and because of uh, the kinds of accommodations that she needed, but so clearly not out of the realm of possibility. Uh, absolutely to be provided for her. Many doctors attested to what she what would have needed in order to uh, flourish and and that was not met. Instead, uh, she was perhaps considered uh, too inconvenient to accommodate. And we're seeing this more and more for those with disabilities and vulnerabilities and sensitivities, which really includes well, a, a huge swath of the Canadian population. And probably at some point us. With, yes. with such yeah. a range of, uh, of vulnerabilities and limitations, we, we have to see that this is, uh, we, we may not identify with a particular story, but there comes a time where we all face a certain degree of vulnerability. And I think we can look and say, who's going to be there to defend and protect and look out for us if there's such an easy uh, dereliction of responsibility to make basic provisions and accommodations and support uh, with something uh, as clear as this. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, I think it's pretty shocking that in Canada, in the in this century, you know, 2022, that we cannot find a way to give people the things they need to live a dignified life and to take care of them in a way that they are not suffering to the, to the extent that they decide that suicide is a better option than living. That's right. And what we learned throughout this article is that she was begging for supports. She didn't want to die. She simply was saying, I can't live this way. Help me to live another way. And it, the article explains how for two years she was advocating for herself. She was fighting for uh, better conditions in which to live and better supports. And she wasn't taken seriously. She, uh, even though she ha had this diagnosis, and even though she had many friends and, and many doctors attesting to her needs, she wasn't able to get them met. Right. So let's just, uh, I'm just going to pull up a, a quote from her. And this is what she said. So the government sees me as an expendable 
as expendable trash, a complainer, useless and a pain in the ass. So I think that's pretty shocking that someone feels that abandoned by society. Absolutely. We just finished discussing uh, a book by an author whose earlier book is about uh, resisting throwaway culture and what a sort of quotation that attests to a sort of throwaway culture mentality where people themselves, people with vulnerabilities, people uh, struggling to make ends meet or living with very con various conditions feel like they themselves are trash. And when someone is feeling this way, what do we say to them? We don't affirm their sense of feeling like trash. That's never the right reaction in all our lives. We learn that when someone's down, our task is to raise them up. And yet with assisted suicide, all we see is affirmation, including affirmation of the despair, of the hopelessness, and of the feeling like trash. But that's not something to be affirmed. It's something to be countered and resisted so that we resist that throwaway mindset. Uh, a person is not trash. A person is the kind of being to whom love is love and respect are owed. And so um, it's, it's so disappointing that uh, we as a community, uh, Ontarians, Canadians, uh, let this woman down. And like you said, it's, it's abandonment. Yeah, and I think what's really happening here, and, and maybe we don't realize it yet, but initially when um, assisted suicide, euthanasia made, whatever word you want to put to it, was brought into legalized in Canada, it was for people at the end of life. So you're, you're dying, you're right at the end of your life, um, we're going to let you end it sooner. Now it's been opened up. So anyone can receive, as long as they're over the age of 18, and now the government's looking at expanding that to mature minors. But um, right now, someone like Sophia at 51, not dying, but decides that her life is too miserable. And so then what she does is she has physicians say, yeah, you're right. Your life is too miserable and we will... Uh, euthanize you, even though there was obviously some pushback from other physicians and even physicians that provide um, made. I just actually want to bring up that uh, uh, slide on that because I thought that was really interesting that the physicians find it unconscionable that no other solution is proposed to this situation other than medical assistance in dying. And the physicians who signed that letter uh, Dr. Chantelle Perot, for example, is a family physician and a maid provider. So she provides assisted suicide. She um, sees that as part of her practice, but she found it unconscionable in this situation because this woman did not have to die. She, all she needed was her living needs to be met. That's right. And so when even those who are involved in euthanasia think that uh, there are cases that go much too far, then how much more will we see a, a risk for uh, th those w living with mental illness as the government is set to expand euthanasia and expand the criteria to include those for whom mental illness is a sole condition? We're seeing such an easing of the criteria and such an expansive uh, broadening of the, the risk, really, to people who at their most vulnerable, at their lowest point, at their weakest, the worst day is becoming the last day. And it's it's really an expression of giving up. And 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 why are we giving up? Uh, yeah. There there are there's so much uh not only cries for help, but cries for hope. Right. And I think that's something that all of us not only um I mean, I think we have to hold the government to account and say, you need to do a better job of providing supports for people, but also us personally, like looking at our own lives and who can we reach out to and when do we um, step forward as an advocate for someone who's vulnerable. And I know that um, all of us have people in our lives who suffer, who suffer from mental illness, who suffer from disability. You can't go very far without running into someone who has those vulnerabilities so how are you stepping up for them? And also, how are you asking our society to step up for them so that we don't leave them abandoned? Exactly, because when a person is experiencing vulnerability is precisely the time when it's hardest for them to be their own advocate. And that's why we see uh, 
the sort of call for others to be an advocate in that moment, uh, because when a person is uh, depressed or when a person is struggling to pay their rent while living on disability assistance, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that's the time where it's most difficult to uh, be someone's own champion. We all need others to step in and to love us enough to decide that we're worth fighting for in our moments of weakness. It's critical. Yeah. And I think it's also um, important as we come out of this pandemic time, which it was so traumatic to everyone. Like, I don't think anyone got through this without feeling some trauma uh, just to, to their being because of the way we had to live and, and all the challenges that came from living through this two year period that it is incumbent upon us to start looking out to others who have suffered as well and really reach out our hands and try and be their advocates. And I think that's something that um, Physicians for Life really focuses on is this whole idea of the physician as health advocate, as someone who does not abandon their patient, who walks with them, who really tries to find the solutions they need to help them live well. Absolutely. So. So on that note, I think, uh, do you have anything more to say about this uh, article? Well, I am very glad to see that this is being picked up in international news because as everyone commenting in the story says, uh, when people feel so desperate that they need to die, it, it summons an intervention by those around the person. And so, um, Doctors are saying, I find it unbelievable that it happened. This is a sad statement that people are so desperate that they uh, feel they want to die. This is a concerning case. So a lot of times people act out of those things of frustration, of despair. Uh, I'm terrified. I don't believe this is the answer. I think the answer is to get together. Uh, so we're seeing all of these uh, reactions that are good reactions to this to this story, a sense that this was terribly tragic and unjust and so i hope uh that in sophia's for sophia's memory uh that we will also protect others like her from uh feeling really that there's no way out other than death but to in such a uh, wealthy prosperous country as canada that we would find every support that a person needs uh to accompany them and their right to live uh, not and, and to elevate them so that they feel filled with hope, uh, especially while they have so many more years of healthy life that they can lead. Right. And I think that it's also really important to for everyone to feel like they have a place here, that they have a place in, in Canada, they have a place in our society, and that they can make a meaningful difference by being who they are. And they have a place to um, connect and um, be part of a greater, just the growth of our country by being a, able to participate in any way that they can and connect with others. And I think sometimes we're too quickly dismissing people who think that, oh, because I have a disability or because I have, I'm struggling, somehow I don't matter anymore. And just going back to that whole, whole throwaway culture, I think that's something that we really have to examine ourselves on and say, hey, am I a part of the problem or a part of the solution here? And how can we really reach out to others and help support them so that we can all just make a, a society where people are really valued for who, for who they are? Exactly. To go back to a quotation we, yeah. we both love, there's that appealing uh, of a vulnerable person to our inner nobility. So how will we be drawn out of ourselves to, uh, as we all see in families, when someone who is the most dependent uh, often draws out the most love from the community and from the family, uh, if only we can surround that person with with affection. Uh, so yeah, I'm I'm thankful we could discuss this story today and I hope others will, will keep discussing it because it's important to know what is happening in our very country uh, and to not, um, not to not get used to these stories. They they should not cease to startle us and shake us, 
to a greater concern for life. For sure. And so I think um, encourage people to put their comments below the video and let us know what you think about this story. And if you have experiences like this or even can think of solutions, things that we can do as a society to make um, our lives better and to help support individuals who are really vulnerable. So thanks so much for joining me today. And uh, I look forward to our conversations in the future. Thanks, Nicole.